everyone, welcome back to Exploring the Natural World. Thanks for tuning in. Today I'm going to talk about photographing and recording video of shorebirds. So if you have an interest in, in photographing shorebirds or recording video of shorebirds, hopefully this video is going to help you out. I'm going to pass along a handful of tips and other information that I think you'll find useful. So for my photography of shorebirds, this is the setup that I'm typically using. I have a skimmer pod that you see here and a version one of the Wimberley gimbal head. Uh, any gimbal style head for the most part will work for this type of a setup. And I'm gonna talk specifically about why I use this setup for my photography. And then we're gonna take a look at recording video of shorebirds, which is a whole different ball game for me in terms of how I approach my videography versus my photography. But for the photography, for shorebirds, you know, first and foremost, you want to be low to the ground, which is why I'm sitting on the ground. And if you're going to be sitting on the ground, one of the things you need to be thinking about for shorebird photography is quite often you're going to be in wet or damp areas. And so for me, I am almost always wearing waterproof pants when I'm in these type of areas. Otherwise, you're going to soak through your clothes and it's a little uncomfortable. And with waterproof pants, you avoid that problem. So for that reason, I'm wearing waterproof pants. The other thing that I like to wear when I'm out on really almost any beach, and it doesn't matter whether I'm here in Massachusetts or I'm down in Florida. Uh, if you watch any of my other videos, you know I spent a lot of time in Florida as well. I always am wearing uh, knee pads. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, first and foremost, to, again, depending on the location I'm at, and here on this particular beach, although it's very sandy and most of the sand is fairly soft, there are shells, there's rocks, you might run into a piece of glass or something like that. So when you're maneuvering yourself around on your knees, having the knee pads, I think, makes a big difference. That's the reason I like to have the knee pads along with the waterproof pants. So let's just get that out of the way. In terms of the setup here, so I'm shooting Canon. I have my Canon 600 millimeter version 3 lens, my Canon R3 uh, camera body sitting on the skimmer pod with a version 1. This is the old or very old original gimbal style Wimberley head. Most people you see out in the field now have the version 2, the newer one that's smaller and lighter weight and so forth. The reason I still have this version 1 is really the only place I use it is for my shorebird photography on this setup. And the reason I like the version 1 is, and even though it's bigger and bulkier and heavier, I do record a little bit of video from this setup and so by having this kind of more heavyweight and, and just a little bit more rugged of a gimbal head, it's a little more stable for the video, which is very important for video because any little shake when you're recording video rolls down the barrel of your lens and your video footage doesn't look very good. While I don't record video of subjects so much moving with this setup because a gimbal style head doesn't work well for recording video of moving subjects because you don't have enough drag, that's what this setup is for. We'll talk about that in a minute. But for photography, this works really well. The other reason I like this setup, and you see a lot of bird photographers using something similar to this, a skimmer pod and some type of gimbal head is, when you are down on the ground like I am now, at some point, you've got to get back up. And the nice thing about this particular setup here is, I can put my hand here on the top part of the gimbal head, and I can get myself up. That makes a huge difference, and the older I get, trust me, I need it. If you watched any of my other videos and you see that I use a flex shooter head for almost all my other photography, which is more like a ball head, you could put a flex shooter on the skimmer pod. The problem is you then would have to put all your pressure on the top of your lens in that flex shooter head, and I don't think you want to do that to get yourself up. This, you're putting your, your weight on the actual gimbal style head, whichever, you know, gimbal style head you're using, and that can support your weight. There's no issue there. So this is the only time I'm really using my Wimberley head, my version one of my Wimberley head, is just for this purpose. The other thing is, with shorebird photography, right, is you want to be low to the ground. That's why you have this type of a setup. With being low to the ground, you're going to get those much more compelling photos those eye-level photos of the birds down on the ground. You do not want to be standing up and shooting down on your subject. You want to be as low to the ground as possible. For my shorebird photography, and let's talk about very specific photos of, of birds now. 
there's a few things I like to get in terms of shorebird photos. One of which is if you can get the bird looking right down the barrel of the lens. This is not a particularly easy shot to get, but when everything kind of aligns up real nicely and you get the bird right down the barrel of the lens, it makes for a really compelling photo. At least I think it does. With this new technology, again, I'm shooting the Canon R3. So if you've got that animal eye tracking, and it doesn't matter whether it's Canon or Nikon or Sony, they all have something very similar. That eye tracking now is making it so you can execute photos that really weren't possible, you know, 10, 15, certainly 20 years ago or more. And certainly not back when I was first shooting film, forget that. Other photos. Subjects that are foraging, they're moving around. If you can get that sense of motion, the foot up off the ground, you get that sense of motion, the bird moving. Again, that, that animal eye tracking makes a big difference. If you've got birds that are roosting, and we're going to talk about that in tides here in a little bit, but if you've got birds that are roosting up in the rocks or in other areas where they're, where they're roosting, with the rocks in particular, take a look at a couple of these shots, the rocks help, actually help in terms of the composition. It adds a whole other layer and texture to the photo of the bird in its habitat while it's roosting. Again, I think it makes for a compelling photo. Birds that are feeding, right? So again, when the birds are out foraging and you've got birds that are feeding, those make for interesting photos. So try to get something that's a little more compelling for the viewer. If you're not getting the looking down the barrel of the lens, if you're getting the roosting shots or other photos, you really want the head of the bird liking, looking slightly back towards the camera, not parallel, not looking away. Try to get that head angle in the catch light, of the bird looking slightly back towards the camera. You'll see a couple of examples here. You're making eye contact with, uh, with the, the camera lens. And in that case, when the viewer is looking at your photo and you're looking at your photo, right, you have a little more connection with the subject any sort of action in the photo, movement, all those types of things makes for just more compelling photos. When I'm photographing here along the Massachusetts coast, I'm typically looking for what is the situation in terms of the tide that particular day. Now, shorebird photography here in Massachusetts can be quite good. It can be quite good for, you know, many months of the year. Uh, the migration typically is starting, you know, sometime in mid to late July and certainly you get into August and early September you know just thousands and thousands of shorebirds moving through but here it is the first week of October and there's still lots of shorebirds here on the coast here in Massachusetts so when I have a situation like I had here this morning and the birds again were up closer to the shoreline I found the area where they were out foraging I got low to the ground I didn't walk straight up to it I just got low to the ground slowly worked my way in position and sat low slow and quiet that's important at that point i'm not really chasing birds there's lots of birds moving around me foraging i've got myself in position i'm low to the ground and i let the birds come to me you would be surprised when you do this and maybe for some people it's not a surprise for those that aren't aware when you put yourself in that position the birds will eventually come right to you in fact with the semi-palmated plovers semi-palmated sandpipers, sanderlings, dunlin, some of the black belly plovers that were here this morning. Once I got myself low to the ground and just sat and wait while they were foraging, the birds just started getting closer and closer because at that point, they don't necessarily view you as a threat. And some of the species, particularly semi-palmated plovers, it's amazing how close they will get, in some cases, really right up on your minimum focus distance. If you have that approach, it works quite well. Now with this skimmer pod, when you do want to maneuver yourself and get yourself into a position, you maybe you want to move your angle and get a little bit closer or whatever. If you're lying on your stomach, I'm going to borrow this footage here from my friend Mike Militia, my good friend Mike, and we use this on one of our other videos. You can see how you can maneuver yourself lying on your stomach, getting yourself into position and kind of slowly moving along and adjusting your angle. And again, low to the ground, very important. You want to be low to the ground. If you're Photographing shorebirds, low to the ground is the name of the game. You want to be low. I cannot stress that enough. That's kind of just an overview in terms of my photography for shorebirds, the setup that I'm using, again, with the waterproof pants, the knee pads, my approach, that sort of thing. Uh, again, with tides, 
Low tide here on the eastern seaboard does not work well. The birds are dispersed. You want that incoming tide, maybe an hour and a half or so before high tide, and or a low tide that's just starting to go out. That's going to work best. For my videography, things are, are different in terms of how I approach my videography. This is my rig here for my videography. And I'm going to pull this lens off here. And I want you to note that, well, a couple things. First of all, this is a Gitzo carbon fiber tripod. This is a Sackler video head. And then this piece here is a custom sled that I had designed for this. And what I've got going on with this particular custom sled is very important for my videography. You've got three points of contact here. This part up here, this little, um, I don't know what you would call it, this little device here that, that, that cradles, I guess, the front part of the lens uh, is very important because when I mount this on the tripod and then I mount my head or, or mount my camera rig on here, you've got this touching the front part of the lens, not the hood, the front part of the lens. You've got the foot here on the lens, which then mounts here, right, which is the center column and post uh, of the actual head itself. That's the attachment point. And then this back part here is adjustable, and this part here hits the camera body. So it looks like this. And so now, this piece is hitting the front part of the lens, your, your foot, on the, again, on the center post here of the head itself, and this part hitting the camera body. So those three points of contact, the hood, where it attaches on the foot, and the camera body, really help stabilize the lens so that when you're panning and recording video, it's very stable. Gimbal style heads in most, most, heads that are used for photography do not work very well for videography. For videography, you want a fluid head, this is a video fluid head, that has adjustable drag, and the drag is the important part. When you have the drag, it makes a big difference. And for recording video with this R3, I can pop the screen out. I don't look through the viewfinder when I record the video. I'm looking at the view, I'm looking at the screen, not the viewfinder, and I can line the subject up and just look at the screen itself. You also can level out the, the base, which is very important because when you're recording video, you have to be level. Otherwise, when you pan, you're gonna you're gonna get your subject's gonna be tilted, right? You're gonna be your horizon's gonna be off axis. It's not gonna look right. So you gotta level out your head and now when I'm recording the video of the subject and I'm panning I've got nice drag so that when I'm panning it's not jittery it's not it just looks much smoother and I'm also recording everything at 4k and I do a lot of recording now uh, at high speed which is for the slow motion which I think looks really cool and so when when I'm recording the video at 4k at high speed, or if I'm just you know shooting at 30 frames a second, uh, boy, the video quality looks really good with these new cameras. The other thing I would say about recording video specifically is, like if you have a subject that is preening or bathing, you want to just like forget every other bird, lock onto that bird, because you'll get this interesting. Let's take a look at this this video here. You'll get some interesting video, particularly in the slow motion where it's bathing, it's leaping up, it's fluffing its feathers, it's opening its wings. Wow, really, really cool stuff. The same thing for photography, by the way. If you've got a bird that's preening or bathing, get on that bird. It's, you're going to get some really interesting shots. But again, for the videography, wow, it makes a big difference. The other thing is, on an overcast day, which is why I was down here this morning, because for, for shooting, recording my video, I like an overcast day. I think it just works a little bit better in some cases. For, for the video. And what I can do is when I get myself in position and I have my subjects in front of me, I can pan with it and at a certain point, 
if the subject is too far off to my to my right but I still got some eye contact with the bird I can just move that screen and I can still see what I'm recording the video on how cool is that with shorebird photography or videography really the name of the game is to get low this is as low as I can get this particular setup here I can't get any lower uh, I mean the tripod legs will go lower but the a leveling base would be in the sand and I can't have that so I'm working on something to, to maybe get the uh, the whole rig a little bit lower but for now this is how I'm approaching it what I would say is get out photograph some shorebirds the whole family of shorebirds is a really interesting group of birds uh, this time of the year most of the birds are in their winter plumage or you've got these young birds moving through but the photography and videography can just be fantastic so get out enjoy the outdoors as always get some great shots work your subjects get low to the ground and just have some fun and you're going to end up with some really spectacular photos so there's my short video on photographing and recording video of shorebirds i hope you enjoyed today's video if you did hit the like button subscribe leave a comment please leave a comment interested to hear what you think and remember, help protect wildlife and help protect wild places. Cheers. Okay, I got to get off the ground. And good thing for me, I have my Wimberley head here so I can actually get off the ground. How cool is that?